why is sexual reproduction so popular? It's actually a mystery um, because males are useless in most species. Ours is atypical. Um, we human males play female-like roles, assisting in the rearing of offspring. But in the vast majority of animals, um, males do no useful work and actually get in the way of female productivity. And similarly in plants, uh, male sex function does not contribute uh, to reproduction, that is to the production of um, seeds or offspring by other means. Um, there's In chapter eight, Heron and Freeman um, discuss uh, this fascinating problem and they summarize current thinking and evidence in section three of the chapter called the adaptive significance of sex. We simply don't have time um, to cover that material, alas, um, in this version of the course. Um, but anyway, I, but you should read it um, if you're at all interested in this. And I'll give you the, the takeaways. The short answer is that sex um, clearly does facilitate the elimination of bad mutations. And we saw earlier in the population genetics section that bad mutations are frequent. There's a constant rain of them and they have to be dealt with. Uh, recombination, um, which sex allows for, um, makes that much more efficient. And it also facilitates evolutionary escape from fast evolving parasites. Um, this is a figure from um, Heron and Freeman um, by uh, Kurt Lively, who you saw briefly in, I think, the last lecture in connection with the story about the uh, fuchsias um, and their red colored um, flowers and fruits um, in New Zealand. That's a story that he and his wife, Linda Delph, came upon because his big um, life project has been to um, document variation in sexiness, that is in the tendency to reproduce sexually as opposed to asexually in a fascinating um, species of uh, freshwater snails, Potomopergus, um, that um, live in zillions of lakes throughout New Zealand, especially here in the South Island where Lively and his students have documented the relative um, frequency of infection by trematode parasites that um, are a plague on these snails and um, the fraction of the population that are engaging in sexual as opposed to asexual reproduction. And as this figure shows, there's a strong correlation between the two and that evidence and other lines of evidence that the lively team have gathered make a very convincing case that um, defense against these um, trematode parasites um, is the force maintaining um, positive frequencies of sexual reproduction, which involves making males, um, which are the easy to measure variable, which is why this figure is that way. All right, but given sex, then what happens? Well, sexual selection is likely to occur and lead to the evolution of sex differences, which we're all aware of, and that's what we're going to talk about in this lecture. Um, our starting point is that males and females have exactly the same genes. Yes, I know there are sex chromosomes in some species, but those are optional. And in any case, even in species with highly differentiated sex chromosomes, like ours, males have the same X chromosome as females do, or um, the same um, Z, um, sorry, females have the same uh, Z as males do in birds, which are also um, genetically, have genetically determined sex, but um, the heterogametic sex is females here on the right in this widow bird, uh, and it's males who are the homogametic sex in birds. Um, so, um, that's not an explanation for anything. Um, we, have to ex under we have to explain why patterns of gene expression have evolved to give males and females different morphologies, physiologies, behaviors, and the like. So that's the problem. Why do the sexes often look and act so differently? Why is the male 
often insanely ornamented, and in other ways often simply insane, as you may have noticed. Well, the young Darwin recognized, as soon as he had figured out natural selection, that a different um, form of selection seems to operate in the realm of mating, and that um, differential mating success gives rise to sexual selection, which he named as a completely different process. We're not so sure today that we see it as quite as different and opposed to natural selection as he thought, but that's a difference of emphasis, not, not really of substance. Okay, so that's what we want to explain. Why um, are, is this male long-tailed widow bird so much larger, more colorful, um, more um, unhelpfully ornamented, I mean, dragging that long tail around is not a good thing um, when it comes to escaping predators, say, and these birds of paradise take it to another planet altogether. So how do we explain it? Um, well, first let's just review what is the variation in these patterns. Um, there's a considerable um, power to discriminate different um, hypotheses. Um, arises from that, as we'll see. So the sexes differ both in the degree to which, I'm sorry, species differ, both in the degree to which the sexes differ and in the ways they differ. And it's important to notice um, the, that pattern. So in some species, like um, these ungulates, uh, familiar to us from around here, um, males tend to be larger than females, more combative, and usually duller. In others, like these fish, um, these are not guppies, but they're, I believe, pisciliids who are related to guppies in the same family, probably. The males are smaller than the females, usually more solicitous and usually brighter. Um, and these syndromes are currently thought to arise in the main from two distinct forms of sexual selection that it's important to distinguish. These are male-male competition, which is operative in these um, elk, and female choice, which is operative in these fishes. Both derive from a really basic asymmetry in what limits reproductive success, often abbreviated RS for reproductive success. Um, this asymmetry was first identified in print by A.J. Bateman in a then obscure paper of 1948 on reproductive success in fruit flies, Rosophila melanogaster, and about a quarter century later, it was developed um, into a cornerstone of the theory of parental investment by Robert Trivers, who published a great paper in 1972 on this subject that really um, uh, established the framework in which we now think about sexual selection. Um, what Bateman noticed is that female reproductive success is typically limited by ability to invest in offspring, which is to say, by resources. It takes resources to make eggs or to feed the offspring or defend them or whatever. Whereas male reproductive success is usually limited by reproductive access to females, who are the ones who got the resources which is to say male reproductive success is not always, but very often limited by mating, um, not by resources. And that was true. Bateman just you know, looked at reproductive success as a function of numbers of mates in fruit flies and got this classic graph showing that for males, zero, one, two, three mates, um, their reproductive success in his laboratory experiment just went up linearly um, with the number of females they got to mate with, whereas the, it was totally different for females. Having one mating gave them about as many offspring as having two or three would give them. Right? For them, the curve just goes up and then levels off. And he was the first to appreciate that that is really the fundamental uh, principle um, or constraint or trade-off, if you like, that um, governs um, this whole subject. And it's also true in plants, even though plants aren't animals. And it's for the same reason. 
that male gametes in plants are inexpensive. Um, it's a bit, the cost to make pollen is not nothing but it's generally not very great, and certainly, in general, less than producing seeds. Whereas female gametes, the eggs are much bigger, uh, even before um, pollination, um, and then seed production can be quite costly um, to the plant acting as a female. And so this, and this works even though many plants, especially uh, flowering plants, um, have perfect Flowering plants often have perfect flowers, which is to say they're often hermaphrodites who function both as males and females, and indeed uh, separate flowers of separate sex and plants of separate sex are a derived um, condition in flowering plants. So even in plants, male reproductive success, whether you are a male or whether you're just a hermaphroditic plant in the side of your life, which is male, um, it's limited by access to female gametes, um, that is to say, to the parental investment that the plant as female is, has put into making eggs and will put into turning those eggs into seeds. But female reproductive success is not limited, or at least not limited so strongly, by access to male gametes, although you'll remember we did see a rare exception to that rule in Candy Galen's um, study of those um, alpine sky pilots um, where female seed set was limited by um, the pollinator activity. But that's an, un an extreme ecology where such things may happen and should be viewed as an exception that kind of proves the rule. Um, here's a more typical plant, wild radishes, um, raffinus, um, a, popula a species um, with different flower colors um, were studied by Maureen Stanton in a classic um, paper, or several actually, where they did um, these cool experiments setting out uh, populations of yellow and white flowers, um, one to one yellow and white in this case, um, and the uh, pollinators preferred the yellow flowers and went to them much more often. And what Stanton and students showed is that this um, preference strongly affected male reproductive success. Um, so um, as, as paternal parents, the yellow flowered um, individuals um, sired uh, far more than their fair share, that is far more than half of all the seeds in these experimental populations and the white flowered uh, plants uh, were the pollen parents of many fewer, but it didn't matter at all for maternal function. Um, they both contributed, both colors um, contributed equal numbers of seeds, and yes, the pollinators did um, discriminate strongly and in a way that explains this result for males. All right, so there's the principle illustrated in plants as mediated in this case by pollinators. Another consequence, or really a, a, a corollary, of this uh, differential, um, of the different ways in which reproductive success is limited for males and females, um, is that the variance of reproductive success, and we do mean variance in the sense that you have learned, that is the lifetime variance, say, um, over males, is usually much greater for males than for females. Um, here are some data for rough-skinned newts um, in this species, at least where it was studied. Most males end up having no mates, at least in a given year, and produce no offspring. But all females mate and have um, and do reproduce. And there's a um, strong positive relationship between number of mates and number of offspring for the males, but not for the females. Um, so the selection on males to succeed in competition with other males is very strong. Um, the blue graphs above are for males, right? There many have no offspring, no mates. That's not true for females below. None of them had no mates, and uh, all of them produce offspring. The variance of reproductive success was less, as we'll see, and this graph shows pretty much the same thing. Howsoever, it's not just about being male 
or being female, as defined by making sperm and eggs. At least in animals, these relationships may be reversed if the species has evolved a reproductive system where males do, as it happens, most of the parental investment after egg production. And some one group of animals that are famous for this are pipefish and seahorses, in which um, the males do the brooding of the young, which takes a long time and is is costly in several senses. Um, and in these, in this group of animals, it's um, commonly the case that the females are more likely not to reproduce at all, uh, and they have the greater variance of reproductive success than males who brood the young, and that's because they are able to produce eggs to give to males at a higher rate than males are able to turn them into independent free-swimming offspring. And so here, again from the textbook, are um, graphs for this study of pipefish um, showing a similar thing. Um, here there weren't um, any females who got, um, yes, there were females that had um, no mates and no offspring, um, but um, not as many males did. So um, qualitatively, um, well, and quantitatively, the same relationship, maybe just not quite as extreme as in those newts. So here um, are uh, clicker questions that you should think about. They could show up. On, on an exam in some form. Um, what about total reproductive success of males and females? Um, the choices are, you know, the sex that invests more in offspring care has greater total reproductive success, or the sex that invests less has the total reproductive success, or the two sexes have exactly the same total um, reproductive success regardless of the mating system. Do think about that and be sure you understand the principle going on there. Um, and sex reversed, so-called sex reversed species occur in lots of different groups of animals. So here's a famous bird, um, how many of you know who it is, who migrates through Utah twice every year. You can see them out on the lake feeding themselves up for their journey north in the spring. Um, males make the nests and provide all the parental care in this species of birds. So you tell us now, this was also a clicker question, which is the female and which is the male? Uh, tick, 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 who's saying what? Let's reveal it. Yes, um, this should be the male, but in fact, it's the female um, and this dull, sensibly colored individual is the male. Um, the predicted consequences of asymmetric limits on reproductive success are um, that in most species where females make the sole or major investment in offspring, the males should be competitive, either in direct male-male competition or intrasexual selection, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, um, or really in the next segment uh, of this lecture, probably. Um, or females should be choosy, um, giving rise um, to a form of um, sexual selection called female choice or um, intersexual selection. But in species where sex roles are reversed, whereas in this phalarope they are, American phalarope, males do the investment, females do the courting, the predictions are reversed. And the females end up being more aggressive, more brightly colored, a bit larger often and so on. Um, this line of reasoning predicts also that sex differences should tend to be minimal in really highly monogamous species where both sexes invest about equally. And that is the case in some groups of animals. For example, many songbirds, where it's really hard even for um, experts in some species to tell the males and females apart without having them in the hand. And there are some primates, some really cute New World primates, for example, in South America, um, where male and female are the cutest couples you ever saw, and you can't tell which is which. Okay. Um, where females are highly concentrated, 
during the mating season. Um, males have the opportunity, if they are basically trapped, as these female elephant seals are, on a small beach um, that's suitable for uh, pupping and free of predators. Um, if males can own the beach, they can achieve enormous reproductive success by excluding other males from access. And um, these sorts of ecologies provide a laboratory um, for the testing the idea that um, really large size and obnoxious behavior in males should tend to evolve in such species. And as most of you probably know, it does. Um, so in elephant seals, um, the females need to haul out on these safe beaches and the males um, have evolved ridiculous uh, size, appearance, and behavior. They're many times larger than females in some species of elephant seals like this one, uh, and they engage in fights that are for all practical purposes lethal, even though they're not literally lethal, for control of prime rookery beaches. The winners um, mate with many females, as these graphs show, um, an enormous variation in reproductive success. Most males die before reproduction, or even if they live, never end up um, being a dominant male and mating, whereas a small handful end up having substantial or extraordinary um, levels of reproductive success. Whereas for females, although still a fair number, um, but not quite as many, um, die before reaching maturity, um, those that um, do reach sexual maturity pretty much all produce one or a substantial number of offspring. Females have little say in the matter because their uh, need for these beaches is so great um, that it's, well, pointless for them to think of doing anything else but go with the flow. Um, males only ever breed once, which is completely fascinating. We'll come back to this when we talk about life histories soon. Um, they, in effect, senesce completely after um, breeding once, if they're ever that lucky, and um, they senesce much more rapidly than females. And the last time I checked in to this study, which is the one at uh, Santa Cruz, um, California, which um, you probably have seen on television, uh, it was still the case that the investigators had never observed a male to reproduce in more than one year of his life. Um, milder forms of female defense polygyny, as this system is often called, um, polygyny for right, multiple gynes or females, and of course it is female defense, because what the males are defending is not the beach per se, but the females that have gathered there. Um, uh, variations on this system occur in many groups, um, for example, in some groups of lizards, um, where females' home range sizes vary a lot. Um, if the females have small home ranges, many of them may be concentrated in a single tree or some other small um, area, and males can potentially defend several territories. But as female home ranges become larger, um, because, say, they need a large home range to feed, um, they should become harder um, to defend from other males. And therefore, the, that strategy of being a pugnacious um, female defending male um, becomes less profitable. Judy Stamps did classic work on this in on, among comparing many species of tropical uh, lizards in the genus Anolis and others and uh, gathered data on home range sizes and um, sexual body size dimorphism for those species. And this figure shows one of her data sets. Um, each of spot is a species um, with female home ranges, typical female home ranges, um, in log square meters on the x-axis, and then um, sexual dimorphism for that species as male to female um, body length ratio on the y-axis, and there is indeed a strong negative correlation between female home range size and uh, male body size, with rough equality of male and female sizes for the species with large female home ranges and ratios as high as 30 
uh, percent or 40 percent um, larger males uh, in those with small home range sizes. There are two potential um, uh, variations on the explanation for this um, that, as far as I'm aware, haven't been definitively um, um, distinguished. Um, it's the pattern is consistent with the hypothesis that males tend to evolve larger body size when female home ranges shrink, um, and it's also consistent with the hypothesis that females tend to become smaller when their home ranges shrink, perhaps just because they're needing to make do with smaller amounts of food. Um, this could be distinguished with the kind of phylogenetic analysis we talked about last time, um, for testis, relative testis size in uh, bats, uh, but as far as I'm aware, it hasn't been done yet um, for these species. Um, Male-male competition also um, takes place by other means besides just um, uh, pushing each other out of some area. Um, male infanticide occurs in lions and a number of other species that have harem polygynous um, uh, ecologies and mating systems where groups of females stay together, providing males the opportunity to secure reproductive access to several females at once by driving other males out of the harem. And um, sure enough, um, in species like of primates and, and big cats in this case, where females nurse um, young for many months. Um, males have evolved a tendency when they take over a harem um, to murder um, the uh, nursing offspring of females present because the males, as it were, can tell those are not their offspring. And by getting rid of the nursing offspring, they can sometimes induce the females to come back into um, estrus and uh, be ready to mate with the males who did the takeover and the murder. Um, this is definitely not good in any sense, literal or metaphorical, um, for the infants, nor for the mothers, nor for the species. Um, but it does tend to increase the frequencies of alleles um, carried by the infanticidal male, and then and so that's the basis for the current theory of why it has evolved. Um, it's a selfish genetic strategy, if you like, um, on the part of males, um, and it, right, it, it evolves despite the fact that no one, even the males, benefit from it, just the genes that made them do it. Um, this is um, also closely related to the sperm competition we talked about um, recently in flying foxes, these uh, bats, fruit bats, and other species that have um, multi-male groups where the males um, compete with each other by make, not by excluding other males from mating with females, which isn't feasible for those species, but they just duke it out with uh, volumes of sperm, which can also be viewed as a form of male-male competition. And this is the figure we saw before, showing there is a significant positive relationship between social group size in the flying foxes and a relative testis size of males. Okay, so let's take a break there, having ended on a low point of um, blood and gore and selfishness, madness of uh, sex and sexiness, and um, when we come back after the break, consider the upside of sexual selection, which is the evolution of amazing charm and beauty.